Culture Movement nonprofit open source called We Vote. And it's been a really exciting time. I have the, the benefit of working with nearly 100 volunteers all over the country, actually. So it's a multi perspective group, it's not just a, us versus them. So, what I'm going to talk today about is what we're doing. So, we've amassed over 1,800 volunteer hours. Uh, including 23 engineers and designers who've done check-ins to our GitHub repository, and I'll tell you what we're doing in a minute. So we are a community of civic hackers. We're looking for more volunteers, more vo uh, board members. So Lee turned 100 this year and voted in her 20th election. Now this is a woman committed to voter turnout. But she's She's not among the majority. 45% of Americans did not vote in this most recent election. 100 million voters. And that's not even talking about, I'm not trying to say these are registered voters who didn't show up. These are people who just aren't registered and didn't show up. So when you take that into consideration with the 14% of Americans, uh, 538 reported this, elected 90% of Congress, we have a situation where we're not seeing the kind of representation that, that I think we can aspire to. Uh, here's a tweet I wanted to share just to highlight how close the national election was. And this is not just limited to national. I think it's all over the country that there's a lot of um, races being decided by a very few number of folks. So how do we as a country <coughs> match Lee's passion? There's a number of ways that we can approach it. I'm just going to, on a very high level, I think what we would is doing to approach this is to create a marketplace of ideas where you can vote within community. There's a lot of fracturing in the country because a lot of the places where we can have political conversations are on the far Facebook feeds or places where we get zinged. So we're scared. I'm scared. I can't post on my, my Facebook feed because of all the... It's not a conversation. It becomes a, it becomes a battle very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think through social buzz, we're in an era, just in the last five, ten years, it's never existed before in human history, where we can spread ideas very quickly in very targeted vertical segments of, of society. Um, I think we're also seeing a, a, a population that wants to have solutions in eight minutes or less, so we have to work with that. And um, one, of the, one of the pieces that we're trying to bring is giving people a, ch a way to vote with confidence, which I personally experienced voting with my community this, this last election. People are in a place of needing support needing community support, and we're, we are here to focus on that. So we are a, a responsive app right now. We're a website. We actually have a strategy for all three platforms. We started on our iOS and Android. I'll talk about the technology stack in a, stack in a minute. So I'm just showing the, mo the website version. So you start with an organization who has voter guides. There's a, there's, we estimate about 10,000 publicly available voter guides right now. You then can take a look at a particular ballot item and see all of the voter guides that you want to follow. You can follow or ignore as many as you like. So when you actually look down your ballot, you get a very quick snapshot of which direction your allies are leaning. So you can then either choose to join your, your folks or you can choose differently. I, on my, looking at my ballot, I found some of them were split 50-50. So I actually dug really deeply into those. The research started. So ultimately what we're doing is we're empowering individual voters to get out the vote. So it's not a broadcast model, it's a network model. And there's a lot of ways that we're looking at doing that. So come join us if you're interested in talking about that. So our minimum viable product, we saw 2,600 voters um, use WeVote this election. Um, it was not meant to be a widespread, it was definitely an alpha test uh, version. And what was interesting, the number I want to highlight is 691 positions entered for 53 organizations. Within two days, we blew past that number with, pro with individual voters sharing 961 positions. And about roughly two-thirds of those were private. So just on our technology stack, if you're an engineer here, we have an awesome team. It's really an amazing way to learn um, React, Django Python, React Native. So it's, it's cutting edge, very scalable. We're very grateful for a ton of organizations who have put a lot of effort into getting the, the political data out and available. Couldn't do what we, we do without them. And if you're interested in joining, we have we, we actually meet weekly in a variety of places. We've got a very active <coughs> online presence, so please come see me.
and I'm happy to answer any questions. When you're talking about <clears throat> scaling this upwards, what type of, I guess, group or demographic do you see adopting this first, and, and what challenges do you see in, in getting those groups to get on the system? Great question. So we're big believers in the crossing the chasm approach of, of really focusing on single a single vertical market. Our first market right now is the uh, Educating and diligent, just because of, of some of those features will be easiest to focus on first. But we're immediately going into, um, I think millennials is a huge group, but we're going to be narrowing down to one particular segment of the millennials. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think one thing you referenced earlier was that echo chamber effect people are talking about on Facebook and how um, do the algorithms, you just kind of see people up your own behavior. and. <clears throat> I think that often causes you to vote in line with the, the network closest to you and not really uh, spend as much time understanding the other side and positions. So how, how do you kind of um, work with that to make sure that the people whose um, votes you're looking at aren't just people in your own demographic but are taking into account people from the other side? That's a very good question. The filter bubble affects almost everything that we that happens in our, in our lives socially, so it's something we need to look at very directly. I think the filter bubble most affects us on the national and state levels, and we're focused primarily on the lo local going up to the state levels. So I think the way that we see addressing the filter bubble issue is that there's, <coughs> around the edges of our networks, if we can have a safe place where there's a c there's civil conversation, you're, you're encouraged to invite more of your friends who are maybe a little bit further out from you, I think that's the way that we can crack through that, that problem. By turning it from a fracturous conversation into a civil conversation of learning. Uh, I guess piggybacking on that question, um, it seems like a lot of the propositions, for example, that you listed there and, and in many other situations, there's a lot of information that would go into that decision to vote yes or no. Um, maybe explain a bit on the platform um, how you bring in more information on the background of a proposition or what issues certain candidates might support, um, how you kind of uh, make that as uh, non-biased as possible, uh, or what that would look like uh, as you move forward. Absolutely. There's a real tension to put more and more detail into Weibo. We've had this conversation many times. We view ourselves not as a voter guide, but an aggregation of voter guides. So we actively work to partner with groups that are putting together that deep level information. I, a shout out to MapLight, has done some great work here in Berkeley. Ballot Ready has done some great work this election. So. When asked how do you make sure that you provide more information, I think the answer is we're striving to make it easy for individuals to put that information in a way that can be spread quickly. Because the sad reality is a lot of folks are going to give us eight minutes and they're in and out. So we need to make it, we need to make those social cues um, useful, I guess, and yet provide links to folks who want to do the deeper research. Uh, there was a lot of controversy in this most recent election about fake news online, and there's some statistics about someone at one point that was something like 20% of all messages posted on Twitter were from one group of bots, fake accounts from Russia, supposedly. And so my question is, do you guys have any sort of strategies to prevent and verify identity or anything like that? That's a very good question. I, I look forward to that challenge, to being to scale, absolutely. I think that the ability to choose who you're listening to is probably the primary defense, is that you're following a Twitter account, um, you're following a known friend. Um, but I haven't put as much thought into it as it deserves, so I appreciate your question. Thank you very much.